were great. So thank Can you again for joining us tonight. And Tom, please. I'd like to ask you a question first. It's on the I'll, I'll stand over here, <laughs> or I'll, I'll walk back and forth, how's that? Um, the question that I would like to pose for you is, what are you feeling? What feelings come up as you experience this film? What feelings came up as you heard things that you may have agreed with or disagreed with? Just what are you feeling? And then take that feeling and distill it down to the most powerful word that comes up for you. One word about what you're feeling. And is there anybody who'd be willing to share what their word is? Jesus. Jesus. Inspired. Inspired. Hopeful. Hopeful. Aware. 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 Abandonment. Thank you. Anyone else? Possibility. Huh. Responsibility. Related to possibility. Frustration. Sadness. Frustration. Sadness. Yes. Bravery. Bravery. Action. 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 <laughs> Frustrated. That's up at the top of my list, too. Kind of horrified. 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 I find our history, parts of it horrifying, and parts of it really exciting and hopeful. So an interview with Bono from U2, who I really appreciate. It was the Christmas Eve before the Sundance Festival in January. We had two days left to get permission to use that closing song that Bono wrote and Johnny Cash sang. We had Johnny Cash's okay, but it was somebody in England that somebody knew somebody who knew somebody was going to a party with Bono, and he heard about this movie and said yes. I grew up in Southern California. Um, I have a cousin here tonight that I'm seeing for the first time since 1971 or two, who lives here, grew up in Libertyville, lives in Chicago, and his daughter's here from Chicago. I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm, I'm just so pleased that you're here and seeing a bit of your family history for the first time. Um, part of my childhood was I don't know, defined by the Watts riots that happened in 1965. And, and for a few years after that, um, racial tension was so high. I lived about 30 miles from Los Angeles. And you could either watch the Watts riots on the news on TV or walk out in the front yard and see the smoke rising over LA. And when I was in junior high school, um, the tension, racial tension was so strong that they had police in full riot gear. My junior high school campus every day because of all the fights between the white kids and the black kids. They had to stagger the hours between the junior high and the high school so that they would stay separated um, and not fight between the schools. And when people think about Watts who don't live in Southern California, all they think about is the Watts riots similar to Kenosha, people who don't live here now, all they think about is what happened with Jacob Blake, Kyle Rittenhouse, the riots here, the, the fires, the burnings. And I think about this day, April 4th. Many of you, I hope most of you voted today in the Wisconsin election, big day, right? The last president was arraigned today, big day, right? By a black attorney general. 55 years ago today, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And here we are. And what do we do? What's, what's next? What's next? Um, one thing on the book table, I'm so glad that Samantha is here um, and that her bookstore is downtown. I visited today um, at Blue House Books and 
We were supposed to have my first two books here, but the publisher screwed up, so they'll be here tomorrow. Um, but we do have book plates that I'd be happy to sign for anybody who wants Inheriting the Trade, which tells so much more than what was in the film, um, and Gather at the Table, which is uh, African American woman and I wrote. She's you know hard as nails, African American woman from grew up South Side Chicago, and I'm the kumbaya white guy from rural Oregon. Um, you know, grew up in SoCal, but ended up in, in Central Oregon. Um, so thank you for being here, Samantha, and, and um, you know, the books are available and we are in a library after all. Um, so I'd like to open it up if you've got any particular questions about this journey um, and maybe from those feelings that were expressed earlier. Yes. So how do you feel now? How do I feel now? I feel m mixed. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful when so many people show up on a Tuesday night, you know, after work, after on an election day, when so much is happening in the world that so many people hear this gives me a lot of hope. When I know that every single social indicator that we want to measure from access to housing, education, health care, um, early childhood deaths, um, the treatment within and by the, the criminal justice system, it's a whole lot better to look like me than it is to look like my dear friend Jeffrey. That's a fact in this world today and that part I, I still find so discouraging. I'm so discouraged by the amount of racism and sexism and all the, the isms and the phobias that we deal with in this country. Um, it, it is so frustrating to me the things that have been done in the name of Jesus. Beneath a church, that dungeon, what we did not show in this film is the lights went out when we were down there. And it's pitch black, there's no electricity. And our sound guy said, I'm gonna have to go to the van to get a new battery. It's gonna take about 10 minutes. And one of the guys said, well, get out your flashlights. And a woman's voice said, why don't we not? Why don't we just sit here in the dark? And we made our way to the wall and sat there in the dark. And I couldn't see, I, I couldn't see my hand. It was, it was pitch black. And you're five degrees from the equator. It was 100 degrees and 150% humidity. It was awful. And I sat there and imagined what it would be like to be here 200 years ago. To be an African person in this position who had my village attacked 600 miles from here inland, torn away from my wife and my children, marched here, watching other people die along the way, be beaten for whatever transgression that the people felt like beating somebody for, and ending up in this dungeon not knowing if my wife is still alive or not, my children, them not knowing if I'm safe or if I'm dead. And then I thought, I'm a white guy in the year 2001. I am going to go home and see my wife. I'm going to cook salmon at the beach with my friends. I'm going to watch my children grow up and watch them have children. And that was not the case for those folks. And that part is just, it's really discouraging that here we are hundreds of years later and there's still so much that has not changed. A lot that has. We've made some really good strides and we've really fallen short in so many areas. So how I feel today is, is kind of mixed. You know, I, I see what took place in Charlottesville. I, I, you know, the gun violence that we face here, the racialized violence that we face here, it's, it's hard. And I'm white. I'm a white guy. I will argue with a police officer that pulls me over. I never had the talk from my dad to put your hands up on the dash. Don't make any sudden moves. Say yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. I never had that talk. 
a different world when you're a white guy. And that much I've learned, but it was that moment in the dungeon that changed everything for me. When I came out, the first thing my mom said when she saw the movie on PBS, oh, I see they beeped you out. What did you say that they had to beep you out? When I said that was all bullshit. But yeah, anything else? Other questions or thoughts, observations? Is this the yeah. normal crowd that you get when you do a lecture? Because we have a black community in this town, and I wish they were here. I wish there were some people here from our community. Um, I don't know this particular community and what the library attracts, and this is not unusual, and it depends on the location. We, you know, Sharon and I when when we were on tour with our with my second book, Gather at the Table, um, we um, were in Chicago in the South Side. I was the only white face in the audience, so it just it sort of depends on the on the location. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'll pay you the $10 later for asking that question. <laughs> the one part that I would push back a little bit on is it's not about us helping black people. Um, it's about us waking up, being aware, being honest with ourselves and our history as people of European descent. What we did to native peoples here, African peoples here and across the sea, um, Mexican people here. I grew up in Southern California, which used to be Mexico. And the reason we fought the, Span the, uh, the Mexican War was because Texas wanted to bring some of their enslaved people to work their land in Mexico, and Mexico said no. So we went to war and created Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, California, over slavery. We don't think about these, these kinds of connections. My dad was a huge beneficiary of the GI Bill, which is, oh, let's reward our returning servicemen at the time, and now servicewomen. But when the GI Bill was first passed, 98% of the money went to white GIs, built the suburbs, People, white people left the, the, the urban centers, which decayed, and moved out and created all these suburbs. And out in these suburbs, what do we pay for schools with? Property taxes. Where's all the value? Out in the suburbs. Who lives there? All the white people. Where's all the good schools? Out here. Brown versus Board of Education. Let's get rid of segregation in the schools. Sounds great until we look really deeply at it and find out that within about eight years, literally half of the African American teachers in the United States were fired. The black schools were closed. Many of the white schools closed and started parochial private schools, Christian schools, in order to not have their kids in school with black kids. So there's, there's always more to these stories. What can we do? The thing for me was at the end of this, um, in Ju January of 2008, just before the film came out at Sundance and just before um, my book came out, which coincided with the release of the film, is we were invited to Eastern Mennonite University, the Center for Justice and Peace Building in Harrisonburg, Virginia, to be there for the opening weekend of something they called Coming to the Table. And I've got um, bookmarks back on the, the book table, both with my website and with Coming to the Table's website. Um, Coming to the Table became the now what, the answer to now what for me. It's, it's uh, an approach to racial healing 
that looks at all of our history, honestly, openly, without shame, without hiding things, just looking, being honest about our history, building relationships both within and across racial lines, authentic, accountable relationships, not let's go bucks and you know, build it on sports or what have you. It's on, it's on important issues to our humanity. And then to work towards healing together by any means necessary. If it's your faith community, if it's your yoga class, if it's your art, your writing, your music, your prayers, your meditation, healing by any means necessary. And then the fourth pillar of the approach is taking action to address these issues, to address the racial disparities that continue to plague everyone in this country. And it's our, it's my liberation as a white man that will be the ultimate beneficiary of this. And the, the Little Book of Racial Healing lays out this whole approach. It explains strategies for trauma awareness and resilience to understand what trauma is and how when we don't heal our wounds, we give them to our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids and thus we are where we are and where we will be a hundred years from now if we don't address this. Um, using restorative justice principles, not criminal retributive justice, but how do we restore, how do we restore things to the, to the best that we can and have agreements together in our communications on how we're going to treat each other and all that's laid out in that little book there. This, you know, in 2008 this started and here we are 16 years later. Um, there were two dozen of us at that time. There's now about 6,000 members nationwide and about 50 local affiliate groups. None yet in Wisconsin. <laughs> And, uh, but you can go to the website to join Coming to the Table. You'll begin getting the newsletter, all sorts of resources. The website is rich with what can I do next, rich. There's a, like a 30-page reparations guide on things that individuals and groups can do. Yes, Brandy. I'd like to build off that question just a little bit. Uh -huh. The privilege of going to Harvard. So as, as people who undeniably have privilege in our community and in our society, what sort of tips, now that you're working in restorative justice, you're working in racial healing, would you have for us to have those conversations with our families, within our families? I think so often when we enter into the arena to look to start doing, whether it's restorative justice or social justice work, we often jump to Two, two thoughts. One is more important than even me helping you. Oh, another white person. Let's have a talk and I can help you. No, it's me. I'm the problem. I'm a white man. I am racist. That is the truth. It's, it, I was raised this way. It's in my DNA. I mean, today, it would not surprise me if I'm walking down a dark alley and I see a, a big black man coming the other way, if I'm going to... When I was younger, I'd have run away. And now it's... But I, I would think about it. It's, it's in my DNA. And so how do I deal with my own issues of racism and sexism, you know? How do I treat my wife, my daughters? How do I treat my female friends? Why is it still today if you and I, at two separate times, go to the used car lot in Kenosha, look at the same car, yeah. I'm going to get a better deal than you are. It's out and out sexism, but that's reality. So on the one hand, it's me that I'm working on. But the other is, find wh whether it's in a, in, a, in a library group like this, or a coming to the table group. I mean, these groups typically meet once a month for a couple of hours. And maybe they're talking about Homegoing or another book. Um, whatever, it might be a movie, um, it might be just a topic. We're going to talk today about 
whatever issue is coming up, you know, George Floyd's murder and the aftermath of that, what took place in Kenosha and the aftermath of that, but having intentional conversations and sometimes it's two or three people, but that's where it starts and that's how we change the world. Was it Margaret Mead? The, the, the only thing that, that, the, that will change the world is a few people doing something. I don't, somebody's got that quote. Come on, I'm looking like an <laughs> idiot here. But we know, you know the one I mean. It's on all of our kitchen walls somewhere. Anyway, but yeah, again, I, I just can't emphasize more how much coming to the table has changed my life my ability to be in relationship, in really deep relationships with white people that I wasn't before, let alone people of color. Yeah. Any other questions, any other thoughts, comments? So, growing up in Pomona, California, I ended up, because of all these racial tensions in junior high school. My dad was having to pick my sister and me up from school every single day. And it was just, I was a skinny little scared white kid and always afraid, always. And my dad and mom took us out of the public school system and put us into a private Christian school. It's all white kids. And we moved, you know, 20 miles away to this town where this school was. So that's where I graduated from high school. Well, this last June was the 50th high school reunion from the high school I did not go to, but would have. And there were about eight of us that went to this. We were invited to go to this reunion as honorary Pomona High Red Devils. And when I was in junior high school, there was, there was a day when two kids were gonna get into a fight, a black boy and a white boy. We all knew it was happening. And after school, sure enough, we go out by the lockers and they go at it. One punch is thrown and we hear the police sirens and around the side of the back of the school comes screeching police car, gets out and the young black boy is immediately put in handcuffs in the back of the car and the white boy, they're patting on the back and saying, are you okay, son? Fast forward 50 years. One of the kids really egging it on was the black kid's cousin, Frank. I was scared of Frank, too, and he was funny. I saw Frank at this reunion this past June. We haven't seen each other in more than 50 years. And I said, how's Brooks? He says, oh, he and his family are living in Wisconsin. <laughs> and how are they doing? They're doing great. And, and we talked about that incident taking place and how, and he says, yeah. He says, we just, we're both grandfathers now. And he said, what matters now is how can we get past this stuff so that our grandkids don't have to deal with the stuff that we had to deal with? What can I do? What can I do? And it's taken a step in the direction of our dreams, doing it wisely, doing it with intention, doing it with accountability for ourselves. Read the books, watch the movies. I mean. I still get, I tear up in three or four parts of this movie still, and I've seen this thing 150 times because it's, it's a powerful statement on what people can do when they work together, what they can hope for when they look honestly at our nation's history and want to do something about it. Not saying it's easy. It's a lot of work, but this is, this is the important work if we're going to make a, a peaceful world to live in. I mean, I've never been in such a, uh, you know, whether it's over religion or politics or whatever it may be, the divisions now are so stark. It's like, oh my gosh, it's unbelievable. What happened with the rest of the family, the 200 people that she invited that, you know, wouldn't, did any of them come around? Yes, yes. All but she mentioned the one guy who was so horribly offended. Yeah. To my knowledge, he's still that way. Um, but they didn't show this, but it's in my book I write about. We had a whole weekend where we invited those folks to come, and about 40, 50 people came to Bristol that didn't go with us to Ghana and Cuba and did a whole weekend's worth of, of work together and, and, and filming that ended up on the cutting room floor. 
There's some that never replied, but also keep in mind, this is a documentary film, there's no money, and we had to pay our own way to participate, which is you know thousands of dollars even 20 years ago when we did this. And if you have a job, you're also taking six weeks off in the summer. So there's a lot of very understandable reasons why people did not participate in, that, in the full experience. Um, as to why they wouldn't write back, I don't, I don't know. I just wonder how to get that, especially family, that won't let you talk about it, don't want to hear about it. Well, and I pushed my way in. You guys went through big time. I wasn't even invited. I, I wasn't. I've, I, I'm, I'm, I owned a restaurant where I live and, uh, and right by the fire hall and one of the firemen came up one time and he says, I think we might be related. My dad's middle name is DeWolf. And I said, well, maybe we are. And he said, well, he has this genealogy book. And I said, the DeWolf book? I've only heard about it. I've never seen it. Well, on my honeymoon in 86, my wife and I went and visited him and he did the whole genealogy chart for Dave and me. So that was in 86. You fast forward to the year 2000, Dave gets the invitation because he's close to Katrina. They're first cousins, right? I'm her seventh cousin. She does, we could get married and have children and nobody would know. <laughs> so Dave gets the invitation. I own a movie theater. Dave comes to me and says, hey, my cousin sent me this. You like movies, you should call her. That was my invitation <laughs> from Dave. So I called her. And she was living in um, Berkeley at the time, going to a seminary and in California, Central California. And I was going down there to go see um, Billy Joel and Elton John in concert together. <laughs> and said, how about if I stop by? And my wife and I spent a couple of hours talking with her. And she said, oh man, this is fantastic. You've got to go. And I said, great. And she says, just find out how you're related to the slave traders. And I said, well, I'll ask Halsey. He'll tell me, the, the Dave's dad. And he said, well, you're in luck. You're not related. You're descended from the brother of the first slave trader. It's not your direct line. It's this other line. And so I told Katrina, she says, oh, sorry. I guess you can't go then. That was the end of that. Two months later, she calls again. Would you reconsider? Juanita, the African-American woman? She's the one who told her, you have to get this guy. He's the only one you're talking to that still has the last name DeWolf. He's not related and he wants to do this work. You've got to have him along. So she's the reason that I got invited ultimately and ended up being able to participate in this. And I'll tell you, the reason I went, since I was in college, I've wanted to be a writer. It's all I've ever wanted to be. And when I saw this opportunity, I thought, finally, I've written 17 different books that are never going to go anywhere. This is a story. And sure enough, Beacon Press picked it up when the, and published it right when the movie came out and, and helped me be able to be here with you. Yeah. Take, take our chances when they're offered to us, right? Anything else? Don't be shy if you've got something. Last chance. See, this is easy for me. This is the other thing. What's hard is talking to our families. Really hard. What's hard is talking to our close friends. Really hard. I flew in here yesterday from Oregon. Brandy picked me up at the airport, dropped me off at the hotel. I come here. I'm flying home to Oregon tomorrow morning. Most of you I will never see again in my lifetime in person. This is easy for me. Not so easy for you all, but that's the work. That's our work. It's our responsibility, and not out of guilt, out of grief, because this stuff is tragic. What has happened and what continues to happen, it's a tragedy. This ought to be top of mind in every church in this country, in every school in this country. It ought to be tops. How do we create a society where people feel like everyone has a fair shake? like everyone is treated the same. Why is it that white people and black people use illegal drugs at remarkably the same rate? But black people are 10 times more likely to be arrested, 10 times more likely to be prosecuted, 
ten times more likely to be taken to trial and found guilty, and like 20 times as likely to be in prison with a much longer prison sentence than the white guy with the same exact offense. Why is that? How is that fair? How is that reasonable in the land of the free and the home of the brave? I think that's our work. We need to change this system. You saw a guy in this movie named Harold Fields. Just very briefly, black guy, he's from Oklahoma. His dad was a plumber. He said, my dad put in the plumbing that came, you know, you, you gotta go in and put that stuff in first. It distributes water and waste into and out of every building, office buildings, stores, homes. He says, and when those things rot, they've gotta be replaced. He says, America has a plumbing problem. We're distributing wealth and education and housing and you know, all of these things that we all rely on to live and it's not being done equitably. So that's our work. I think a lot of it is teaching the kids. Oh. Because I'm from Tennessee. I was raised in a sundown town. Yep. Which I'm sure you've yep. heard of. I'm in, uh, Oregon's I a sundown that. state. <laughs> <laughs> I broke that cycle. And I have black friends and stuff. And, uh, and I think raising my kids that way is it's really important I mean you're right it's the key it is the key I mean our children that's I talked to my kids about this stuff and I mean the first time they saw this film it was hard I mean I've had people tell me Ugh, I'm really glad I'm not you I wouldn't want to be related to those people and I said do you suppose your um, ancestors wore cotton clothing Ever? Think they drank coffee, put sugar in their tea, <coughs> ate rice? The entire world economy was based on slavery the way it's based on oil today. Slavery was the oil of its time. And everybody with skin the color of ours benefited and others suffered. And that's, that's the reality of it. So. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for staying. I have to say, when I first reached out to Tom when we were planning our homegoing um, events, I was just absolutely thrilled that he got back to me right away to hear about coming here. And we had the great chance to chat a couple different times and the entire ride from O'Hare to Kenosha yesterday. I don't think we stopped talking for a second. No, moment. yeah. Um, and I knew the moment I talked to him that bringing him here to share the story, um, to share of himself, and to share of the work that we at the Public Library believe in do on a daily basis uh, would just be so monumental and a great way to kick off our big read. So I'm going to let him go get a drink of water and get ready to sign books. But before I release all of you, I'm going to remind you that we do have more programs for you this month. If you have not yet picked up your program guide, we have some in the back. A few of note would be April 10th, we are bringing in Dr. Paige Glotzer from UW-Madison to do a programming program on the history of redlining real estate and race. And she's specifically pulling data from the local area here in Kenosha, which is fascinating to see. And then May 8th, we'll be having Yaj Yassi join us virtually um, for a virtual program and discussion to talk about not just her book, um, but where she feels now, having written this book in 2016 when she was just 26, and now looking at what we've all been through in the last few years, um, what she reflects upon, what might have changed as she was writing it now, and just the different themes and characters. So thank you all again for being here. The kickoff is amazing. Oh, please. What, one other thing about Oregon being a sundown state, when, when we were considering becoming a state, only white landowning men could vote, and there were three items on the ballot. One, do we become a state of this union, which passed by like, was like 75% yes. Are we gonna be a free state or a slave state? We're gonna be a free state by even a little more than that. Third ballot measure, are we gonna allow free black people to live here? Almost 90% said no. So we remain one of the whitest states in this union as a result of that. That was in the books until 1937 that it was in our constitution in the state of Oregon. 
So there's a lot of yeah. history to dig into. If you're ever looking for resources, your public library. Your <laughs> public library. You're in the right place. Thank you, folks. Please help yourself to more refreshments and go visit.